BioBalance HealthCast, Episode 116, Erectile Dysfunction from a Psychological Perspective. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging, covering treatment and solutions that include bioidentical hormone pellet therapy, safe and affordable skin rejuvenation, and spa quality botanical skincare. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Today we're going to talk about ED, but not in the medical, exactly medical way. We're not going to talk about the cause in terms of physically what is wrong with you when you have ED or physically how do we fix this. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about the causes that are more than physical. They're, they're psychological. They're part of who we are, our personalities, what we grew up with or what we, what we are living through now or situational. What in our situation is keeping us from being able to climax or for men to have an erection? Yes. And that's your area. Well, I spent 30 years as a, a family therapist seeing clients and have talked to thousands of men and women about the, the elements of their intimate relationship and what works for them and what doesn't work for them. And one of the things that I spent a lot of time listening to people talk about is issues around having or obtaining, uh, maintaining a satisfactory erection for a, a fulfilling sexual encounter or sex life. And there are, as we discussed in our last podcast, a lot of physical, mechanical causes that contribute to that. And we talked about what some of those were. We will be talking probably today a little bit about some of the treatments for those things that, that help adjust it. But if, but if I can frame this conversation in a, in a larger focus than just ED, you know, Kathy, what you and I have spent a lot of time working together on as we've written our book and as we've seen clients that, that are cross-referenced, uh, people get in relationships and over time, you know, it, it's like you fall in lust and then you fall in love. Uh, when, when you're young and you meet somebody, it's like, okay, I could do that one, I could do that one, I could do that one. Well, you can't necessarily do them, but you, you fantasize. Men and think people that. Have, I don't remember ever thinking that. All right. Well, I've <laughs> talked to women who do okay. think that or tell me that they do. But, but you, you attend to someone and you're energized by someone and you desire someone. And then relationships get habituated, life intrudes. And mm -hmm. you have children, or you have house payments, or you have overtime at work, or have you have arguments. Christmas shopping, or you have an argument, and 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 they don't. There's so many social blocks, uh, religious blocks, whatever, to having conversations about sexual matters. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot, I talk to so many people who think that it's just supposed to work. It's just supposed to happen. <laughs> why didn't it work? And why aren't we both satisfied? And, and how come he or she won't do this or that or the other? And at some point in those conversations, what I start to hear is people say, well, I can't. It, it doesn't mm -hmm. happen mm -hmm. for me. It, you know, I don't get an erection or I can't keep an erection. And I don't know why. Uh, and so the, what we're going to talk about today is some of what we know about why that sometimes happens. Mm -hmm. Not as, as a panacea to say, oh, well, if you just you know, eat more wheat bread or something, you'll solve this problem. That's not what's involved. Uh, but haven't you, ta haven't you told us before that it's like an ap appetite and people come to, into a relationship with two different kinds of appetites. And so just like everything else, you have to have a compromise. So there has to be an overlap. You know, it's, it's like uh, the knuckles on on a train uh, where, where boxcars join together. They mm -hmm. flex and and adapt mm -hmm. so that as you go over different terrain, it doesn't mm -hmm. break apart. Relationships are like that. Mm -hmm. And so there are times like if you have siblings, uh, I talk to people all the time. It's like, oh, I love all my brothers and sisters equally. Well, that's crap. You don't. <laughs> uh, sometimes you have a favorite, and over time that favorite will change. You know, if you've got three brothers, you like Tom, and then you don't like Joe, but then all of a sudden you're liking Joe a lot, and Tom ticks you off. You know, so it flexes. Relationships endure, and the same thing happens with a husband and wife. There are times when you really like them. I mean, one of the, one, from a therapist's point of view, one of the worst things you can hear is, uh, I really love you, I just don't like you. 
You know, I'd yeah. much rather hear you really like me and you're hoping that you'll fall in love with me or stay in love with me because <laughs> liking is a critical component. Mm -hmm. And we get busy, we get distracted, we get upset, and especially if there's an imbalance in desire mm -hmm. because, again, we don't have those tools for talking about the fact that there's an imbalance of desire. You don't want it as much as I do. You don't want it as often. You don't mm -hmm. want it the same way. I don't want it the way you want it. We don't, you know, that, that whole uh, literature about arousal and foreplay and invitation and mm -hmm. stimulation and, you know, uh, bringing the mind, which is your most sexual organ, into the sexual conversation. And How, nobody talks. No, nobody talks. Nobody talks to each other about what they want or what they don't well, want or the when risk. they want it. They just, they think it's supposed to be a mind ESP thing. Yeah, like I'm a Vulcan like, mm, mind meld, you know. I'm supposed they, to be at work thinking I want to do that tonight and you're supposed to get it yeah, across Yeah, automatically. Town. Yeah, we were signaling. It doesn't work like that. I, it just, but no one's taught that, and the movies tell us different things, and our parents don't talk to us about it, and or they do, and we don't want to hear it from them, and everything seems to confuse us. Yes. But when say we have we have the desire or we have it back, mm -hmm. then when I mean women can I mean women can fake it. It's not good for you, but you can I've fake it. I've heard that. But men can't, and that's a big deal. So with ED. <laughs> A lot of things oh, yeah. contribute to that. So, so say just say we figured out everything, but one of us gets depressed. Yes. We have a good relationship. Depression is one, one of, of the reasons why men have erectile issues. If gets, they are depressed, gets just, they don't feel good about themselves. Mm -hmm. They have a chemical depression, mm -hmm. and it may not be related to hormones. It just may be their own chemistry in their brain. And then, and, and then it may they, not be related to relationship issues. I mean, it often is. Maybe relationship internal. issues cause depression, but so do other things. And so, mm -hmm. depression in and of itself can be uh, a contributor to it's one of the most common sexual causes. satisfaction, sexual arousal, and desire, and for men, erectile problems. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the complications of that is that a lot of antidepressants then inhibit sexual arousal and, and sexual erectile uh, functioning. Yeah. So, so, yeah. You have to make the choice. Do I want to have erectile dysfunction or do I want to be depressed? Yeah. I mean, it ends up being that choice. And that's a difficult thing well, to deal with as a, a physician. Well, it's a relationship complicator. What I talk to people about is if one of you, either of you, are on antidepressants, for many of the antidepressants with this component about loss of sexual desire, and responsiveness. Mm -hmm. It can happen a couple different ways and, and generally physicians don't tell you this in, in my experience or in my client's experience. Mm -hmm. And so if you're taking an antidepressant for a period of time, you may discover that you don't think about having sex. You don't get horny. You don't right. become aroused independently. Mm -hmm. Now if your partner approaches you, you can be responsive. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh yeah, I forgot about that, mm -hmm. but we can do that. Mm -hmm. And you can be responsive. Although, again, at times, in the middle of being responsive, all of a sudden the chemical switch throws and it's mm -hmm. over. Right. And I hear your that. partner is going to think, it's about me. Mm -hmm. I'm not doing it right. I'm not doing it the way you want. Uh, you don't love me. I'm not attractive. I'm overweight. I didn't get my hair done. Should I have fixed uh, steak for dinner, you know, they, they, in their own heads, they extrapolate all these possibilities, mm -hmm. but they don't talk to you about it. And so when I do marital counseling or relationship counseling, and I know that antidepressants are a component yeah. of their lives, I talk to them about if this happens, you need to be talking to each other because it's not a, uh, a rejection mm -hmm. of your partner. And you guys need to be talking about this. This isn't about you. It's about the medicine. Mm -hmm. So let's start over or let's wait 24 hours and try it again, you mm -hmm. know, but again, the person that's taking the antidepressant is not likely to be the initiator. And oftentimes they're the ones that just give up the antidepressant because it's ruining this portion of their life. And yet then they are stressed then out and, and then they're depressed. depressed and, <laughs> and they're hard to live with. We're always hard to live with if we're depressed. Oh yeah, is. yeah, there's no joy in Mudville. So oftentimes in the depression department, anti even if antidepressants are used, if, mm -hmm. if it is a male using the antidepressants, we can get around that mm -hmm. sometimes by using Viagra. Yes. Or by using Cialis or one of the ED drugs. Right. So if that's tolerated, if that those drugs are tolerated, we can get around the antidepressant. On the women's end, 
that kind of thing doesn't work. Right. And oftentimes, their depression can be from lack of testosterone in their if it starts in their 40s, if it's not a lifelong thing. Mm -hmm. And we can give testosterone and leave them on their antidepressant for a few months into the testosterone treatment and see if they're a lot better and see if right. we can wean them off the antidepressant. Because even if they get, if they're depressed because of their testosterone, mm -hmm. then I can get them off of the antidepressant. If that's the reason for the depression, Right, yes. then they'll be functional and they won't be depressed. And the sexual arousal issues will come well, back for yeah, them. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And, and so, so that's why depression can cause sexual problems, mm -hmm. but it can also complicate it with the medication. Well, so, so let's segue into another issue. Uh, for some men, erectile problems occur because of performance anxiety. Mm -hmm. And if you have a, uh, <laughs> I've talked to a number of men, especially younger men, who articulate a fantasy about a sexually aggressive woman. <laughs> You know, I'm walking down the highway and a carload of, of uh, nymphos stop me and demand that I satisfy all of them, and it's great. I mean, I've had teenage what boys. What a creative mind they have. Well, <laughs> you know, I mean, they're trying to find the solution to a problem <laughs> that they don't have the social skills to satisfy, right. and so they mm -hmm. fantasize. Okay. But it, in my experience, with women who are much more sexually liberated and free with themselves than a lot of women are who come in and say, I am sexually demanding. I am mm -hmm. aggressive in asking for or seeking what I want. And I find that men are afraid of me. Men yeah. veer yeah. away from me. They don't want that. Mm -hmm. You know, they say they want it, but they don't want the it. The fantasy is that they the want fantasy it. They don't really want, want the it, fantasy because it, it. it's scary. So sometimes in situations where you have performance demands or performance expectations, you shut off and it's not there. And once a man starts to worry about, do I have an erection? Am I firm enough to be functional? Mm -hmm. His huge. opportunity is lost because it's not going to be there. Yeah. If you start thinking about it, I mean, and, and, you know, we, we tell you, don't think about it. It'll, it'll just happen. <laughs> Doctors How, you know, love to tell, like saying, we love to tell people think about, don't think about yeah. infertility. Don't think about, you know, yeah, just don't think you about can't it. stop thinking about but it. But if you start thinking about it, and, and so you get caught in this paradigm where you become your own worst enemy mm -hmm. because you're thinking about it. And that's a, a whole relax, trust, be safe mindset. And one of the complementary responses that couples can make is to talk about having an erection, having vaginal penetration, having orgasm, is not the end-all be-all of sex. Oh. It's not the end-all be-all of intimacy. There are many other ways to have an intimate encounter mm -hmm. and a sexually satisfying encounter, for your partner at least, that mm -hmm. says, I love you, I cherish you, I want you, I want you mm -hmm. to feel good about my loving you, that doesn't necessarily hang on the hook of an erection. And so if couples can embrace that concept mm -hmm. and, and participate in that kind of sharing, the issue of performance anxiety sex will deteriorate and, and then mm -hmm. the performance will be there. Sometimes what we recommend to people, especially people that have had relational issues and, and desire functionality issues and mm -hmm. then they've been restored because of treatment, often I will give them homework. Mm -hmm. uh, I will say to them, your emotional balances have been so far off that your bodies have forgotten how to love each other because you've been mad and you've been hateful and you've been avoidant and non-responsive. <laughs> and so now you need to learn, you need to let your bodies learn to care about each other again and be safe with each other. So one of the assignments that I'll give them is go home and for five minutes stop everything. Pay attention to each other and Turn hug. off the TV. Turn off the TV, <laughs> shut the door, don't answer the phone. Don't worry about his dinner being cooked. Spend five minutes in the physical space of one another attending to that. Be in your body in the moment and be aware of your sensation. Look in their eyes, breathe with them, touch their skin, feel the texture, hug them, but absolutely do not be sexual. Don't touch them in a sexual way. Don't touch them in an arousing way. Just be in that safe space again physically. I mean, so how does that work? Well, Usually they have Very sex, right? often they, <laughs> no, typically they'll come in and say, oh, we forgot to do the homework. 
Oh, oh we couldn't find time. We didn't have five minutes. Five minutes. The kids needed help with their homework. They're, they're avoiding it. So we keep working until, until they actually try it. Mm -hmm. And then they'll come in and they'll be sheepish and chagrined. Well, we tried to do the homework, but we end up having sex. Uh, oh, so, so, so we sad. We failed our job. <laughs> <laughs> then we all laugh about it. It's like, okay, so what's yeah. the message? What's the lesson learned? Mm -hmm. Uh, but so much of that is about safety and trust and intentional intimacy that, that men in particular have to learn is not about sex as orgasm. Right. It's, it's not about scoring or getting off. It's about being with this woman in this zone where the focus is on the global experience and not the, the specific experience. But, the, but I've seen women in my office come in and say, now they're all fixed. Yeah. And their husbands had testosterone, so they assume they're going to just snap right back into Mr. Macho. No. And this, the, the female partner is saying, well, you just don't do this for me, and you don't do that, and they're, they're just they're mean. And well, that's they, not helpful. They're, and they're, they're, they're <laughs> I, dumb I can meaning, tell you, that's not helpful. Just not mean, yeah. but dumb meaning. And so, yeah. so their, male, their husband goes, you know, he, he looks sheepish. He looks like, well, you know, and I can see why he, he would not be able to perform. So there we have to go back and get past the anger and hurt that she's yeah. felt because yeah. that's what she's expressing, mm -hmm. and, and somehow bring him back into the relationship as well so that he's not fearful of her. Well, and, and so I'm that's so glad that you you're were... willing to have that conversation with a woman and, to, mm -hmm. and, and as a woman be able to say to her, okay, as I'm listening to you, these are the things that are setting off alarms for me mm -hmm. based on what I know. I try to have those conversations with couples too, mm -hmm. and sometimes that male-female boundary mm -hmm. is there, and they're like, you know, you're taking his side or... <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's you know, always a problem. Uh, yes, but he hurt me, and he has to hear how much he's hurt me. Well, yeah, maybe but some for a while. But that's not. But there's a point at which it's counterproductive. Mm -hmm. And that's you know? it's it's not productive if you do that. So so then you get back to performance anxiety mm -hmm. as an issue because if she's critiquing and attacking, that is he's a, not going to be in that mood that where his system will work. And there's nothing, there's nothing testosterone or Viagra or anything else is going to help because you could have all the chemicals in the world. If you have this behavior that's not working mm -hmm. and it's not working in this way, the attacking way, it's never going to work. Mm -hmm. So you have to go through therapy for that. Yes. That's just not something you can, in fact, not something I can just bring to your attention and have it all better right then. It just doesn't <laughs> work that fast. You have to go through a lot of talking and getting it all out and then... It, and going through what Brett talks about. It's not going to be a miraculous epiphany. Uh, <laughs> it, it, you're not going to suddenly start we speaking in wish. tongues. <laughs> you have to learn how to do these things, and you have to approach it with an open mind and an open heart. I'm willing to have this conversation. I'm willing to experiment with new approach attitudes mm -hmm. or receptiveness attitudes. Uh, I'm willing to learn to talk. You know, what do you like? What do you want? It's how do you verbalize. like it? It's hard to verbalize wishes and well, desires it's hard for some and it's people hard to, do to that even talk about sex without it being perceived as a critical attack right you know to, to, to talk about what I would like to try doesn't necessarily mean you lose or you yeah you know it, right. it, it's, it's, and it can, it can be, be invitation no matter how you say it it can yeah. be taken that way so if they're defended then it's going to be taken that way so that's why it takes counseling it takes somebody bringing this out and saying I hear you say this, and, and this is what's, we're, translation, that's what you need. You need translation between the couple. You do. You need those communication mm -hmm. skills. But, but there are also some other components before we run out of time. You know, we, we talked about depression uh, as a clinical issue. That causes uh, ED. We talked about performance anxiety. Generalized, there's, there's a category of disorder in psychological literature called generalized anxiety mm -hmm. disorder. If there's a lot of crap going on in your life and you're under a lot of pressure and you can't turn your mind off and you are worried about a lot of other things, many people have trouble turning all that off to go into this sexual or intimate compartment. Part of it is they're hypervigilant. Like if you touch them like this, oh, they, yeah. they do this. Yes. So being touched is not something that makes them feel good. It makes them feel more anxious or so that has to be I, i've had women say you know my my husband comes home and he wants me and i want to spend time with him but the teenagers are in the house 
or the phone is ringing, or I turn the pot roast on and I suddenly worry about uh, the fact that the stove is on. You know, and they're distracted and being hypervigilant about all these mm -hmm. other responsibilities of the mom mm -hmm. where they can't take 10 minutes to just indulge well, in connecting with that moment. Mom. Yeah, I they understand They can't that. go from being mom to being sex object and go back to being mom in 10 minutes. It doesn't just, it doesn't flip on and off like that. That's, you, have, you have to think it about takes, it and plan for it. Because you have to plan for it and you have to have some, you have to have some safety in the environment. The kids aren't going to just bust through your door. Remember, failure to plan is planning to fail. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So you've got to set yourself up for success. Well, I, I have a friend who will remain nameless, but her... <laughs> Her parents had the best thing I've ever heard of. I've just, I just have never heard of this theory. They had, they had many kids, and on Sundays after church and after yeah. lunch, they said to their kids, "Absolutely, you all take care of yourself. We are in our room. Their doors locked. We need us we, time. We need time for us. Unless someone's bleeding." <laughs> or has to go to the emergency room, you are not to knock on the door. Mm -hmm. And I mean, people got in trouble if they knocked on the door. Yeah. And that was their time. They had like four or five hours all by themselves before dinner, and they could do whatever they wanted to, and that's why they had so many kids. Well, and it's crazy how, <laughs> it's crazy how creative kids can that's be. That's really I, simple. I used to work with uh, consulting in a lot of schools, and there were issues with kids who always wanted to get out of class and go to the nurse and they were they had anxiety problems and other kinds of problems but so one of the solutions that we came up with because teachers are not nurses and they don't mm -hmm. know is it really a medical issue or yeah. shall I let them go to the bathroom and the nurse or not uh, and so we would advise you know if you're not uh, projectile vomiting and you're not bleeding you can't you go to the diarrhea. nurse and you don't have a you know <laughs> fever of, of yeah. what and so then the teachers would feel more comfortable and I remember a couple of kids who learned to like picket themselves in some way to get blood. And it would just be a little bit of blood, but they would get blood. And Are it's like, okay, I have to go to the nurse. Are you everybody a way to wait, get their kids or their parents out of no, the bedroom? No, <laughs> no. What I'm saying is you, you have to teach your children what that means. Yeah. You know, if it's not a true emergency, don't knock on that door because right. this is mom and dad, you know, nurturing time. Uh, it's not your turn. And, and you know what? Kids need to learn. It's not always yeah, their turn. Yeah, they need to learn that you have to have time to yourself or you'll, you'll become less and less of a human being. You'll be whittled away until you're just kind of nothing by the time you're 45. Your child is naturally <laughs> narcissistic, and you have to teach them to get over that grandiose narcissism. And they have to learn that they're part of a family. Uh, they're not Blue Jay babies. They can't always just get demand uh, <laughs> response. And so you have to teach them wait time and turn taking. And if you don't, it's kind of like being on the airplane. You know, when the oxygen mask comes down, if you don't take care of yourself mm -hmm. and your husband or wife, you can't take care of the kids. It's just not going to work. So, so all that comes back to erections and good sex. Yeah, that's right. And then you're not so exhausted because you can take a nap as well. But you have, yeah. And through the whole week, if you look at it this way, I can stand anything if I've got Sunday afternoon. You know, some of that has Sunday to do afternoon with that. is a rest time, contact time, but don't habituate sex to every Saturday morning because it becomes a chore. Yeah. And then you get those well, performance expectation mm -hmm. issues. If you only have routines for intimacy, you won't have intimacy. Right. So think outside that's true. the box. But if you do have a time that's always set aside, yeah. then you don't miss it. Set aside as time out from the world, right. not necessarily as performance of a particular sexual behavior. Okay, yeah, that's true. Okay. That's true. Well, so, thank you. Thank you for listening to you. us, and hopefully you learned something about ED that's not just medical, clinical, that's something you can use in your own lives. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. Follow Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Brett Newcomb can be found at brettnewcomb.com.